All right, let's move on to our next speaker, Jane McAdam. Scientia Professor Jane McAdam is an international authority on the legal frameworks that shape the fate of the world's displaced people. She is the founding director of the Andrew and Renata Caldor Centre for Refugee Law and the academic lead of the Grand Challenge on Refugees and Migrants. A big problem. <laughs> I look forward to you solving that one. Uh, here to talk about protecting people displaced by disasters and climate change, please welcome Jane McAdam. Every second, someone is displaced by a natural disaster. Each year, that amounts to 26 million people. Compare that to the 21 million refugees in the world today displaced by persecution or conflict. Now, the difference is that refugees cross an international border whereas people displaced by the impacts of disasters or climate change generally move within their own countries. But some people will be displaced across international borders, and for them there is no clear legal framework in place which protects them, which protects their needs and their rights. In our own part of the world, when Cyclone Pam hit the South Pacific last year, 70% of Vanuatu's population were displaced, and about 45% of Tuvalu's also. Now, most of that was temporary, all of it was internal, but as we see the impacts of climate change make events like cyclones more intense and other events more frequent, we're going to see this kind of displacement more and more often. At the same time, slow onset processes like sea level rise are also going to have an impact on the habitability of particular parts of the world. And before island nations themselves are inundated by seawater, long before that, people are going to have to move because they're not going to have fresh water to survive. In fact, a number of years ago in 2011, Tuvalu declared a state of emergency precisely because they ran out of fresh water and Australia and New Zealand shipped in temporary desalination plants and rehydration packs. A temporary response, something that is clearly not going to be sustainable over the longer term. Current international legal frameworks don't enable people who are displaced across a border to have legal protection. And particularly what they don't do is enable people who sense a risk in the future to move in, in anticipation of that risk, which is, of course, an entirely rational thing to do. Under international law, only a handful of people are entitled to international legal protection, and they are refugees, people without a nationality, stateless people, and people impacted by certain serious human rights violations. The reason why I'm talking today about climate change and disasters is because when it comes to people's rights and needs, it doesn't really matter whether the thing that's triggered your movement stems from one or the other. And of course, climate change is likely to amplify the impacts of certain disasters. So disasters, if you like, become disasters on steroids. Climate change and disasters on their own don't displace people either. What we're talking about is a multi-causal phenomenon as someone in Bangladesh told me, climate change is the straw that breaks the camel's back. It overlays things we're already facing, like general poverty, a lack of livelihoods, a lack of other opportunities, living in generally environmentally fragile areas. I want to briefly run through the international legal framework to show where its potential is and where the gaps are before coming to what I think are some of the solutions. In international refugee law, someone's protected as a refugee if they've crossed a border and they have a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of their race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or their membership of a particular social group. As the law currently stands, showing that disasters or climate change constitute persecution is going to be extremely difficult 
but the further obstacle is to show that that's on account of your political opinion or your race or the like. And as we know, the impacts of disasters and climate change are indiscriminate. So refugee law is not going to be the answer. Under human rights law, people are protected against being sent back to a place where they feel that their life is going to be threatened, essentially where they're not going to be able to survive. It also protects people from being returned to inhuman or degrading treatment. And it's easy to see how cumulatively things like lack of water, lack of ability to grow crops, lack of shelter and so on may amount at some point in time to inhuman or degrading treatment. But the, the key point there is at some point in time. And right now, which is the time frame that a decision maker would be looking at, it would be considered sufficiently safe for people to be sent back to most of the places that we're talking about. So what do we need to do to fix this? A lot of people think, we need a new international treaty. Isn't that the obvious answer? Well, there are a couple of responses to that. And the key one, perhaps, for now is this. We have the Refugee Convention, which has been adopted by the vast majority of countries in the world. That's an international treaty. We also have the highest number of refugees in the world at any time since the end of the Second World War. For a treaty to have impact, it needs to be ratified, but it also needs to be implemented. And that requires political will that simply doesn't exist at the moment. So while a treaty might be the sexy option, there are actually far more mundane, day-to-day -day things that governments could do right now that would have a real impact on people's lives. And part of this is moving from remedial responses to more proactive strategies. What we need is a toolkit of responses. We need to look at ways in which people can remain in their homes when that's what they want to do, but also how they can move themselves safely out of harm's way if that's what they would like to do or need to do. A toolbox was what the Nansen Initiative on Disaster-Induced Cross-Border Displacement came up with last year. This was an intergovernmental initiative spearheaded by Norway and Switzerland. Australia was also one of the key players involved. And last year they released this protection agenda, which among other things sets out this toolkit approach towards addressing climate and disaster related displacement. And 109 governments endorsed this agenda as, as providing a really positive and effective way forward. So what do we need to do? Well, the first thing is that governments need to enhance disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation measures. Simply having building codes in place can make a massive difference because people are living in safer shelters to start with. Having early warning systems for cyclones, for example, is another mechanism that can save lives because people can get out of harm's way rather than being hit uh, by a disaster and caught up in it. This will build community resilience as well. Secondly, no matter what happens now, some displacement is inevitable as a result of climate change. That means we need to have in place now some temporary protection strategies so that if people are displaced across a border, they're not going to be sent back immediately, they're not going to be deported, but they know they can remain and wait until it's safe to go home. And what we know from all the, his the evidence historically is that people generally do want to go home and rebuild as soon as they can. Thirdly, and this is particularly relevant for our part of the world, we need to enhance voluntary migration. This is something that the president or former president of Kiribati uh, described as migration with dignity. How can we create ways in which people can move in their own time with dignity if they wish to? And there was a very interesting example of Australia cooperating with Kiribati to assist in this way. It wasn't framed as being about disasters or climate change, but it had the ultimate objective that we're trying to achieve here. It was called the Kiribati Australia Nursing Initiative. It was a small-scale project that enabled 90 students, so it was around 30 a year, to come from Kiribati to Griffith University and train as nurses. Now, Kiribati needs nurses, so if they ultimately went home, 
that was considered a win for, for Kiribati. But at the same time, it also opened up opportunities for them here because very often they were able to get a temporary graduate visa, in turn be sponsored by a, an Australian organisation and then remain here um, on a more permanent visa. That helped to address a nursing shortage in Australia and also globally because, again, people might choose subsequently to migrate for work. Similarly, we can have things like free movement arrangements, um, other special visa categories. There are a whole range of things that could be done that can enhance that in anticipatory movement. And the final point that's about proactive responses is planned relocations. This is something very controversial because most planned relocations in the past have been in response to large development projects like dam building. And generally, they've resulted in far greater impoverishment and vulnerability for the people who've been moved. And note I say the people who have been moved as opposed to have chosen to move. That's one of the key problems. Now, most planned relocations will occur within countries, not across borders. But I had the opportunity to interview people who, over 70 years ago, were moved from present-day Kiribati to Fiji on account of phosphate mining. And those people today still talk about a very strong sense of injustice, a feeling that they had no say in what happened to them. And this is, of course, the risk that if we don't have participatory frameworks and, and clear consent, then we are going to perpetuate those cycles of injustice. The interventions that governments like our own and others around the world take today, whether they be legal, scientific, technical, or other policy interventions, are going to determine whether people are displaced at all, and if so, for how long. They will determine whether people can lead lives in dignity, or whether they will face further vulnerability. So today's actions by the Australian government, by governments in our region, and the decisions that governments collectively make at the global level are going to determine whether we see future humanitarian crises or well-managed responses. The one thing that we know for sure is that the costs of inaction will far outweigh the costs of action. <laughs>